Great, I hope you guys can all see that. Um, sorry I'm having some audio issues this morning. From what I understand, everybody can hear me, um, but I wasn't able to hear Sarah Lynn, so I'm not sure what's going on with that. Um, however, it looks like we are good to go. Happy Friday, good morning. I hope you're enjoying all of these lectures. Thanks for having me. Um, it sounds like we've had other speech pathologists. My um, clinic director, Dr. Deb Suter, was presenting earlier. And so we're just going to continue the SLP love this morning. Um, today I'm going to be talking about vocal cord dysfunction and paradoxical vocal fold motion. Um, my name is Lauren Shinusky. I'm a speech language pathologist here at the University of Kentucky in our voice and swallow clinic. So Today, what are we talking about here? I'm gonna be defining VCD and paradoxical vocal fold motion, PVFM. Um, some good things to know about with these patients in terms of getting a case history from them. The clinical pathway from them getting through everybody to us finally at the end and differential diagnosis of different disorders versus VCD. Um, what goes into a speech pathology evaluation and how we use um, the laryngoscopy in a therapeutic manner, um, what we do for behavioral treatment of this disorder, and then the efficacy and prognosis for these patients. Um, also, before I forget, um, chat feature and question and answer, um, feel free to ask questions in there whenever. Um, I don't mind if you ask questions in the middle. I'll also probably stop at some point, just ask if anybody has questions, but ask questions whenever. Um, so let's just make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of terminology for vocal cord dysfunction. Um, in the past, it's been called a number of different names, a lot of them having some sort of um, like a psychological underpinning to them. Um, but today where we're at, um, and the last, I'd say, probably 20 years, we've been using the terms vocal cord dysfunction, or VCD, um, as well as paradoxical vocal fold motion, which is a great term that outlines exactly what's happening. Um, these are the terms that you're going to see most of the time today, and they are the same ICD-10 um, billing codes, so something just to keep in mind with that, they're exactly the same. Um, we like personally paradoxical vocal fold motion better, again, because it outlines exactly what's happening with the vocal folds. Um, for us as speech language pathologists, it's not uncommon to get a referral from a um, outside source or from someone who doesn't deal with vocal cord, vocal cord dysfunction often. And um, they use this term for something else that's um, dysfunctioning with the vocal cords. Um, so not necessarily the breathing issue. Um, so there's something to keep in mind with um, these patients is that you might walk in and they might have a, a VCD diagnosis, but it might actually be something else and this might be a misunderstanding. So some other terms that are coming um, into play over the last five-ish years have been episodic laryngeal breathing disorders. Again, just really encompassing um, all these different things that we've learned over the years. And then exercise-induced laryngeal obstruction, or EILO. Um, this is a exercise-specific variant of VCD or PVFM. Not all VCD or PVFM incidents and episodes are exercise-induced. So again, EILO is specifically um, a exercise-induced variant that's coming into play. All right, so what is this disorder, right? The big question. Um, as we know, when we're breathing, the vocal folds should stay nice and open to allow air to go from the lungs up through the trachea, through the larynx, and out through the mouth and or nasal cavity. However, with this disorder, something is causing the vocal folds to adduct, primarily during inspiration, but it can also be during expiration. Um, and that's causing essentially upper airway distress and respiratory distress. Um, this can also not only happen with the vocal folds, but also other supraglottic um, structures, particularly the ventricular fold. Sometimes the epiglottis can get involved. Um, this is all in the absence of overt laryngeal pathology. So there's the, when the person is asymptomatic, a lot of times their larynx is grossly normal. Um, so it's really important to get a picture of these folks when they are symptomatic. And primarily, this disorder is treated behaviorally. There are some um, other organic underpinnings, but it's um, primarily treated behaviorally. So etiology, 
Um, PBFM and VCD are really in their infancy in terms of um, awareness and literature. So there's a lot that we don't know, um, meaning that it's very misunderstood, it's often misdiagnosed, and it's very often mistreated, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, we're still learning a lot about what causes it. However, we do know that there are connections between a couple of different factors um, that occur often. Um, the first one being laryngeal hypersensitivity. So thinking about like your, um, your irritable larynx and other folks that you might see that have laryngospasms or a chronic cough. There is so much overlap between VCD and laryngospasms and chronic cough. And um, this article I outlined here does a really good job of explaining the, the um, similarities and differences between these different um, things that we see. Some different stimuli that can cause laryngeal hypersensitivity and overreaction um, by the mechanism include um, you know, allergies, post-nasal drip, um, post-URI, it's not uncommon to see someone with an irritable larynx, um, other inhaled um, substances that can irritate that area. Um, LPR and GERD can be big ones for these folks. So um, that can be a, a number one cause. And then psychogenic factors, um, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of times these um, disorder, this disorder was um, treated psychologically at the beginning. Um, we know that about 20% of these episodes are triggered by stress. Um, however, a lot of these patients are sometimes dismissed that it's just stress. Um, so sometimes you'll see a psych, um, a psych diagnosis that might not be completely the case or was just because of this breathing incidence. Um, we know that 73% of these patients with VCD have a psychiatric disorder diagnosis, um, primarily anxi anxiety being the big one, um, but OCD and other mood disorders are also kind of lumped into there. Um, we know that with these patients, about 38% have some sort of um, history of abuse in their past. And so keeping all these different factors in mind is really important. So patient populations, who is um, coming into the clinic for this disorder? Um, in terms of age, it's a lot of older children and younger adults. So it's about 65% adults, 35% children. But of the adults, it tends to be younger ones, median age of 36. In children, it tends to be older children and teens that we're seeing. Um, we see that these um, that it's more common in females, about a three to one or a two to one ratio of females to males. And it's not uncommon to see um, certain kinds of personalities or different um, factors contributing to VCD. For example, high achieving children, um, whether that be academically high achieving or athletically high achieving, um, these children can be more susceptible to um, having VCD. Also elite athletes. Um, I saw a report that said about 5% of Olympic athletes have a VCD diagnosis and that um, cold is their big trigger for this. Um, so keeping that in mind. And then active duty military can also be more susceptible to um, having VCD. So the clinical pathway prior to them getting into a speech pathologist's office, um, it's often a long and very frustrating road for them to get to us. Um, we like to think of VCD as a diagnos diagnosis of exclusion. So it's really important for us to have them see other professionals and make sure that other medical conditions that could be more serious and treated differently are ruled out first. So um, this can lead to a lot of frustration that when they finally get into our office and they're saying, oh, I've seen this person, this person, this person, but you're the one who can actually help. Why didn't I go through all of that? And why did, I, um, why did it take so long for me to get to you um, is the primary complaint. So um, keeping that in mind with these patients and if they're children, they're their parents. Um, is really important. So let's talk about the path getting to us. Um, a lot of these patients present to the ER 
for dyspnea. Um, sometimes we'll, their um, initial contact will also be their primary care physician, but um, it's not uncommon for them to have a history of um, being frequent flyers in your ERs. So um, this first set of data is fairly old. It's about 25 and 20 years old, but included 122 patients between these two studies. The average length of asthma dis misdiagnosis was almost five years. 81% of them were treated with daily prednisone. In the year before their presentation, these patients averaged 9.7, almost 10 ER visits and almost six hospitalizations just in that one year because of their dyspnea. Um, in, the first 20, in the first study, 28% had been intubated at some point. In the second study, 7% had either been intubated or trached. Um, and 52% had been needlessly treated with bronchodilators, which again goes along with that asthma misdiagnosis. Um, it's not uncommon for these patients to have um, to lose consciousness or to become lightheaded. And so um, presenting to the ER is not uncommon. Um, you know, when I was reading over this data, I was really hoping that the information would get better and that we'd be better at treating and diagnosing these patients over the last 25 years, but we haven't really gotten any better. There's still a lot we need to know. Um, study out from 2018 said that about 90% were misdiagnosed and mismanaged for seven and a half years on average. Um, a lot of times these patients are brought in or are present in the ER, they are given nebulizer treatments, maybe an anti-anxiety or a benzo, and they are sent home. So um, something to keep in mind for our physicians out there who are seeing these folks in the ER. Our next big one to rule out is pulmonology. Obviously with breathing issues, you wanna make sure that um, their pulmonology, that pulmonologically, um, they are safe and good to go there. So like I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon for these folks to have a past or even a recent asthma diagnosis. Um, it's not uncommon for them to come in and say, yeah, I was diagnosed with asthma when I was however many years old, and I had it under control with um, X inhaler for a long time, but then that one over the years kind of stopped working, and so we switched to this other one, and that one never really worked, and we switched to this other one, and that one never really worked, and so um, a lot of times, um, I also mentioned down here, um, little to no benefits or even worsening of symptoms with inhaled steroids, so these patients typically have a, a long history. Um, the biggest one that we see during um, spirometry and PFTs is that they have a flattened inspiratory loop indicating somewhere along the line they have a, um, you know, some sort of upper airway obstruction impacting that inspiration. Um, O2 stats stay within normal limits or near normal, even when these folks are symptomatic. Uh, methylcholine challenge is a lot of times going to come out negative. Chest x-ray is going to be clear, no signs of any foreign body aspiration. Um, and during spirometry, a lot of times these reports say that the reproducibility was poor or that there is high variability with getting these patients um, provoked and, and tested. Um, and also no cyanosis with the change in, um, with the stability of the O2 stats. Other folks that these patients have encountered along the way commonly, um, the first one being cardiology. A lot of times they've been cleared by, by cardiology. Um, if they've seen allergy and, had, and have had allergy testing done, um, sometimes they'll find allergies with certain items. However, um, they're mild and disproportionate to the level of distress that they're experiencing. Um, so allergy doesn't always explain it fully. Um, sometimes they've seen GI and have been cleared or they've been diagnosed with GERD or um, LPR or some sort of acid reflux issue. Um, like I mentioned earlier, these patients a lot of times have been um, dismissed by psych or dismissed to psych as having an anxiety or mood disorder. So having that diagnosis is not uncommon. As um, ENT folks and speech pathologists, it's always important for us to rule out any neurological or structure 
structural issue that could be contributing to this. So making sure that there's no vocal fold paralysis, subglock stenosis, um, pharyngeal constriction, retinoid prolapse, um, laryngomalacia, spasmodic dysphonia, and then like foreign body aspiration, like I mentioned earlier, making sure that we're ruling out all of those different factors. Um, something else I want to mention is that um, a lot of times these patients come in and they say, oh yeah, so-and-so taught me some breathing exercises at some point. They never really helped. Um, and so it's really interesting to, you know, see the different breathing exercises that they've been taught and um, just learning more about that because as speech pathologists, we're going to be teaching them other breathing exercises. Um, so that might affect their buy-in with the therapy. However, I'll talk about how we combat that. So case history. Um, case history is very, very important. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but in addition to your standard case history, these are the things that you want to watch out for and, um, and you know, ask your patient about if, if they're experiencing these sorts of things. Um, the level of acute respiratory distress can range from mild to severe. So um, keeping in mind just the whole range of what's going on with these patients. Um, anterior neck and throat tightness is um, a big one with these folks. And again, trouble with inhalation and that leading to stridorous, um, noisy breathing. Um, also lightheadedness is not uncommon. Sometimes these people have um, lost consciousness and I think the biggest thing that you want to know about is um, specifically learning about these episodes. Um, what are their triggers? For example, is it um, a strong odor that they smell? Maybe it's a perfume or a cleaning product or something really oddly specific like a um, like the smell of a dry erase board marker or something like that that sets them off. Um, sometimes exposure to cold can be a big one, whether that's a cold drink or cold air. Um, in some of your high, hotter climates, that's going from, you know, like um, going outside in the summer into a building that's um, air conditioned, like a, like a store where they're blowing that air conditioning on you. Or if you're like me from northern Wisconsin, it's going outside in the middle of the winter from your house. Um, that can be a trigger for people. Exercise, I mentioned, can be a big one. Um, there's even that exercise-induced um, leg of this disorder. Air pollution, um, or either, um, or even like allergens, seasonal allergies, um, smoke inhalation, other inhaled irritants can cause this. Um, even for some people, voice use, so laughing, um, talking, singing for long amounts of time can set people into um, a VCD episode. I'm also really curious to know about um, their onset of symptoms and really the timeline of, um, of this entire episode. You know, at the very beginning, maybe they feel a tickle in their throat, a need to throat clear, something like that. And then it turns into feeling the throat tightness and then they hear the strider, you know, all these different patterns um, you want to know how long these different things are taking, you know, if they're exercising, is it coming on pretty quick? Is it slower to come on? Um, and then also recovery, how long is it taking for them to recover? What things do they have to do? Are they trying different breathing exercises? Are they coughing? Are they just stopping their activity and just sitting there um, trying to recover their breathing? Um, what things are they doing? How long is it taking? Um, it can be really helpful for them to mimic an episode for you um, so that you can hear, you know, if, um, if a patient is unsure if their um, stride or wheezing is during inhale or exhale, it can be really helpful for them to just show you what they mean and then get a sense of um, the throat tightness or area of constriction. Um, other diagnoses that these folks might have, as I mentioned earlier, reflux, allergies, a psych diagnosis. Um, you want to learn about their medic medications and treatments for those different di diagnoses. Um, and then because we know about some correlations between um, psych, we, I like to get a good understanding of these patients and what they're like. Um, for children, I think it's really important to look at the parent and child dynamic. Um, 
specifically like the older children that you can specifically ask them questions. You know, you get a whole range between kids who know everything and they're really only using their parents for a ride to the appointment um, or kids that you ask them a question, they go, um, and then they look over at their parents for their parents to answer or just parents that kind of take over the whole session. Um, with kids, I, I want to know about school. Do they like school? How is it going? Is school hard for them? Um, different factors that could be stressful for them. Um, if they're athletic, I like to know about their, um, it's not uncommon for um, the chest to also feel that. Um, with asthma, it's going to be more difficulty with getting air out and the noise and the wheezing is going to be expiratory. Whereas VCD, it's going to be more trouble getting air in and it's going to be more inspiratory starter that they'll be experiencing. Um, like I mentioned with the inhalers, VCD is, or um, asthma is probably going to respond to inhalers. VCD is probably not, or it's going to be even worse. Um, with asthma, the onset tends to take a little bit longer when it's exercise um, driven and the recovery period tends to take longer. Whereas VCD, it happens more quickly within um, the span of an exercise and tends to cover more it tends to recover more quickly. So um, keeping these different factors in mind to help you kind of parse out. However, um, BCD and asthma can co-occur, which makes things even more challenging. Um, again, we're learning more about um, VCD as we go here. It's still in its infancy. Um, so we've and according to the data, it's somewhere between 8 and 56% of these patients have co-occurring um, asthma and BCD. So um, it's not always a clear cut, this side of the chart versus this side of the chart. Um, it's been noted that about 14% of severely asthmatic children also have BCD. And in terms of therapy for children, I think this information is really telling and leads to a really good prognosis for children with BCD and or asthma. Um, most children over the age of eight that have both can distinguish between whether they're having an asthma attack or whether it's um, PBFM or VCD. They can distinguish that and they can tell which thing is happening and then they can respond appropriately. So I think that's again, really telling and a great prognosis for treating children with this disorder. So other things that we could be thinking about, um, there are so many other factors that can cause dyspnea. And so this is a nice little list of other things to be thinking about, um, particularly if um, it's not a clear, if, if the cause of the dyspnea isn't super clear, or for me, if I'm starting to treat a patient and we're, we're not making good progress, then these are kind of the other things that I'm thinking about and um, thinking about making other referrals if necessary. Alrighty, um, before I get into laryngoscopy and treating, um, I do want to um, see if there are any questions. I'm sorry, I can't see my chat feature, which is really frustrating. Um, let's see if I can find my chat. And of course I can't hear Sarah Lynn, so I don't know if there are any questions. Um, sorry, I'm a, I'm a Zoom newbie here. Um, okay, let's wait till the end, um, just in case there were questions, I'm sorry. Um, so flexible laryngoscopy is super important. It's the gold standard for diagnosing VCD. Um, obviously you can't use a rigid laryngoscopy to perform um, to be able to have these patients do all the different breathing techniques that they need to do. So flux is important. Um, we're going to be talking about the clinical findings, both while these patients are symptomatic and asymptomatic. We're going to talk about provoking their symptoms and um, how you can go about doing that safely. And then the therapy approach, stimulability and therapeutic laryngoscopy. So first off, the clinical findings that um, that we're seeing with these patients. Um, when they're asymptomatic and not having any dyspnea, you're gonna see a grossly normal larynx. Um, phonation's gonna be normal, vocal fold mobility is gonna be normal. Again, you wanna rule out all that subglock stenosis, vocal fold um, paralysis or paresis. 
um, laryngomalacia, retinoid prolapse, anything that could be contributing to um, an obstructed airway that needs to be addressed that can't be treated very well with behavioral therapy. Um, it's not uncommon because we know that there's that correlation between um, laryngeal hypersensitivity. It's not uncommon to see um, laryngeal reflux tissue changes or even just allergy irritation in a larynx. Um, they said between 36 and 95% of children with VCD are going to show some laryngeal tissue changes. Um, however, when a person is symptomatic, that's when you really see, you really get a good shot at what's going on. Um, so when, this when these folks are symptomatic and when you're provoking their symptoms, you're going to see vocal fold adduction greater than 50% of the glottis. Um, again, primarily during inspiration, but it can also happen during expiration or both. Um, you might also see some fluttering of the vocal folds that might happen during in inspiration or expiration. Um, you'll likely see and hear inhalation phonation if the vocal folds can, um, can adduct or abduct enough to get to that point. Um, a diamond-shaped glottic gap, I'll show you a picture of that in just a sec. And then also I like to look at just the patient's upper body, making sure that the upper body isn't um, overly active and potentially causing extra um, tension in the upper body. Um, and also breath holding can be a thing. Sometimes it's a, almost a maladaptive um, technique to hold their breath. So here's what we're looking at here. Um, let's look at this picture on the right first. Um, grossly normal airway when this person is um, asymptomatic. However, you do see that adduction during um, inspiration when symptomatic. This is that diamond-shaped glottic gap that I was mentioning just a second ago, um, where essentially the anterior third to two-thirds are adducted, and then that posterior glottic chink is helping to maintain the airway. So making that little diamond there. Um, there are fair, grossly two different presentations of this. There can be really a glottic presentation and then a superglottic. With the superglottic, you're going to see more of those, um, those other structures getting involved. The ventricular fold, sometimes the epiglottis can create that um, airway distress. Um, however, we're focusing more on the glottic presentation. So on this side, you see all of these folks at rest. They're getting really good abduction of those vocal folds during inspiration. However, when they um, are triggered or during this one, during exercise, that's when you start to see the closure. So um, about halfway here with this first one, more than that with the second and fairly close with the third. So it's really important because they can look so normal at rest to make sure that you're getting a good picture of them when they're symptomatic. However, that can be challenging. Um, so like I said, it's really important to make sure that you're seeing the larynx when they're symptomatic, just because it can go from looking grossly normal to being the source of the issue. Um, however, this can present a lot of different challenges. Um, the first one being patient safety. Really, um, just because, you know, the level of dyspnea can be anywhere from mild to severe and then, you know, up to the level of needing a trach. Um, it's really important to be super careful. Um, just a reminder to everybody that speech pathologists are not um, medical doctors. And so it's really important for us to have physician support nearby in case that there is a medical emergency, which we always hope that that does not happen. Um, but it's definitely um, something to keep in mind if you're going to try to provoke a patient. Um, you know, if they have inhalers, EpiPens, anything like that, it's really important that they bring those to the session. Um, I don't know if I'd feel comfortable doing um, a provocation if those two things were issues and they didn't have that. Um, again, or also, we want to avoid any nasopharyngeal anesthetic just because that can throw off the sensation in the larynx as well and um, either change what's going on there or alter the sensation and cause even more distress for these patients. Um, Clinical resources and just time and space and technology can be a huge barrier to this. Um, you know, the best thing to have is a big treadmill. And some people don't have the space for a treadmill or they don't have the funding for a treadmill um, or their, their um, scheduling doesn't allow them to 
have um, enough time to, you know, provoke a patient for some reason. Um, also, some of these patients have unreliable triggers or they haven't had an episode in a while. So that can make it even more difficult to try to provoke them. And then high level athletes, if you're working with someone who um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of intensity to provoke them, it can make it even more difficult to provoke them. Um, having, you know, if they're running, trying to crank up that incline on the treadmill and really um, increasing the intensity um, and the speed can help, but um, sometimes these athletes are just insane and they take a lot to provoke. Um, when provocation is not possible or it's unsuccessful, you just can't get it, you just can't make them symptomatic for some reason, that makes the case history and that clinical pathway that the patient has gone through even more important. Um, again, making sure that things are ruled out, getting a really good case history is of utmost importance here. Um, so let's talk about different ways that you can provoke a patient. Um, if they are someone who is exercise induced, um, being able to scope them while they're exercising can be really beneficial. Um, obviously, not all of us have this really cool, fancy setup here. Um, obviously, and it's um, pretty big, so you need to have the space for it too, and probably not cheap. Um, so for this, you have, you have a treadmill and a um, scope cart essentially attached so that you can have a patient see the laryngoscopy on the screen. They're also being scoped at the same time. The scal is wearing um, a headband sort of contraption. I've also seen like helmets that help that. And then she has a tape to her face so it doesn't move. Um, and then she's also strapped in with this huge harness just in case she were to fall or lose consciousness. Um, this one also has ECG and pulse ox with it. Um, but obviously not everybody has this setup. We don't here at UK. Um, so something else that you can do is um, you can have them exercise and then scope them right after while they're still symptomatic. Um, I like to essentially um, set up a patient, get them ready to go for laryngoscopy. And then sometimes um, at a past place I used to work at, we used to have a treadmill just down the hallway. So we'd take them down the hallway, have them run the treadmill and then get them back and get them scoped. Um, or exposure um, to cold air, having them stick their head outside, going outside if it's winter time or whatever you need to do to try to trigger that based on the individual's triggers. Um, also, if um, it's a smell trigger, sometimes it can be helpful to um, have the flexible scope in place and present them with the smell triggers, um, more controlled to so like spraying a paper towel and presenting it. Um, depending on their level of severity, you might not want to get it that close to their face. Um, again, very individualistic. Um, when it's not safe to do all these different things, you might have to come up with some other options um, to safely challenge their respiration. So here at University of Kentucky, this is something that isn't published or we have data on, but we found that having the patients count from one to 100 as fast as they can can sometimes trigger a VCD episode just because their respiration is being thrown off, their normal pattern of breathing when they're speaking is being um, challenged. So that can be something that might provoke your patients. Also having them mimic their symptoms um, so that you can see, you know, how close do the vocal folds get to each other? Um, what's the level of throat tightness in there? And just be able to see if the larynx is causing the issue can be really helpful as well. So again, patient safety, um, making sure that, um, you know, patient safety is, is number one and it's, and it's not worth it to provoke their symptoms if you're putting them in danger. Um, as speech language pathologists, using laryngoscopy therapeutically is super, super important. And it's really um, the most important step in treating these patients. Um, so I just want to quickly define a couple of different terms that are used in the speech pathology and rehabilitation science worlds. Um, the first one being stimulability. And so when I think of stimulability, I um, am thinking about when I first see a patient um, and I'm evaluating them and I'm essentially doing a mini therapy session. I'm pulling out some of my tried and true techniques. For example, um, if it's a voice patient, pulling out some 
and they have a really rough voice, seeing if I can quickly get um, some clarity in their voice. Or with VCD, I'm taking my um, tried and true breathing technique and I'm using it while they're symptomatic to see if just the behavioral changes alone can benefit the patient. This is also a really good way to gauge um, prognosis for the folks. Um, negative practice is also something that can be really powerful. Essentially, once you've established um, and trained that, um, that breathing technique or whatever technique you're training, having the patient switch back and forth between, um, between what they're doing when they're symptomatic and when they're asymptomatic, now that they feel like they have volitional control, that can be really helpful in, again, um, establishing that they have volitional control over this, but also helping sometimes identify the symptoms that they're experiencing. So for example, with VCD, when they're doing the breathing technique I'll talk about in a second, their throat feels nice and open, they feel like they're getting air in, their breathing isn't noisy, versus when they're symptomatic, breathing is noisy, throat is tight, all the other symptoms that they're experiencing. So switching back and forth can help, um, can be a really, powerful um, therapeutic tool for us as speech language pathologists. Um, so before I even get the scope in place, I like to tell the patient that I'm going to have them um, doing some different breathing techniques while I have the scope in place. And so I like to teach that first. So I'm not trying to teach and scope at the same time. Um, the big thing that you want to do is um, train the inspiration. Our goal of this is to achieve maximal abduction of the vocal folds when, um, when the body is telling those vocal folds to close and activate that PCA and really get things opened up. So the best way to do that is to do three really quick sniffs in through your nose like this. <laughs> three really quick sniffs. They're pretty powerful. I hope you could hear my, my nose there. Um, and some patient, patients will say, oh, well, I can't breathe through my nose or they're an athlete and they can't it's unrealistic to have them breathe through their nose. So a nice strong inhale through pursed lips is really helpful too. And notice that you could hear that one a little bit more. The noise is coming from my lips. It's not coming from my larynx. So I'm monitoring that as well. It's all coming from, from my lips. And I can feel a nice cold sensation in the back of my pharynx indicating that I'm getting um, air into my throat. For the expiration, again, we want to maintain that airway patency, so making sure that the vocal folds aren't continuing to close up um, and really counteracting that, um, that abduction or that adduction, excuse me. Um, so what we want to do is to create a slow, high pressure exhale. This can be done with, with flat lips like this. My lips are really nice and flat, air is escape, escaping slowly through them, and they're high pressure. Um, also, different ways to do this would be through um, our high-pressure, voiceless um, speech sound, so a s or a th or a sh can all be helpful. However, they're kind of noisy, so something to keep in mind as well. Um, again, we're always looking to observe that upper body tension and neck tension and addressing that as needed. Um, Visual biofeedback is extremely important for these patients um, for a number of different reasons. So like I mentioned earlier, we're looking at the larynx while it's normal, we're looking at the larynx while it's provoked, and now we're also looking at the larynx when we're treating. So it's really a good idea to be able to show the patient these images, whether that's during their endoscopy, if they're um, tolerating, it, tolerating it really well, or after, after you've taken the scope out and whatnot. Um, so really that patient education component, the anatomy and physiology, showing them that um, showing them that when they're breathing, their vocal folds are nice and open, but when they're symptomatic, their the vocal folds are closing. And then when they do that sniff inhale, it's essentially what you're going to see. You're going to see them blow open nice and um, briskly. And then they're going to, a lot of times, you're going to see that maintained through the getting all that air out. So using that as a really powerful tool, again, it shows them that they have reassurance and that this is under their volitional control. Um, that what they did with the stiff inhales actually helped open up the larynx. So that's an, a really important factor there. 
And then also demonstrating the effectiveness of the breathing techniques. I mentioned this earlier that these patients have a lot of times received breathing techniques somewhere along the road um, and they didn't really think that they were helpful. So this can be un important with buy-in because they're actually able to see the vocal folds go from this or closed up to wide and briskly open. So um, that can really help with the buy-in. Throughout the entire process, it's a good idea to have the patient just do a simple um, from one to 10, how is your breathing and how is your throat tightness or there other symptoms. Um, so having them do that while um, you're taking the case history, finding out during the episodes what levels they're at, um, before you provoke, during provocation, and then after once um, they've become stimulable. So getting really good ideas of how they're doing throughout the process and that can help you gauge how successful the technique is besides just observing the vocal folds. So generalization, you found that these techniques are beneficial and that they're helping. Um, you want to continue to train this technique and then generalize to other situations besides just your clinic room. So um, it's really important for these patients to practice when they're asymptomatic. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the whole stress component and the distress, um, the last thing you want them to do is to um, start having an episode and then they're thinking, oh my gosh, Lauren taught me those breathing exercises. What were they? And then they start to freak out even more. It's like, man, I can't remember those breathing exercises. They're supposed to help. Um, so having them do these when they're asymptomatic um, not only helps with that automatic response, but also um, if there's residual laryngeal tension going on that's, that's, um, that's there more persistently, that, this can help relieve that. Um, they recommend about five cycles, so um, five, in, or, um, five cycles of inhale and exhale, about 20 times a day. That's a lot. Um, but again, we're trying to retrain it and get that automatic process going. Um, for children, it's not, um, it's not a bad idea to get the school SLP involved. Um, this is typically not a disorder that warrants a full IEP. However, it can be important and um, helpful to have another set of eyes on these patients um, while they're at school or when they're in PE or in their sports. So um, that may be something that you want to do as an SLP um, is reach out to their school SLP if you're able. Um, as always with a rehabilitation, um, with, re with rehabilitation, you're always wanting to monitor progress and, um, and be dynamic and making sure that you're treating these patients to the best of your abilities. Um, in terms of the typical length of course of therapy, the data says about nine, nine I'm, I'm sorry, about eight sessions for these, pa for these patients. Um, some of them recover in as little as one to two. Um, however, I really hope that you're not spending 95 sessions with a patient. I think that's really um, a sign that you need to, oops, sorry, that you need to reevaluate what's going on. Um, it's, again, it's always a fluid process. You're always wanting to um, get an idea of if there are any barriers, continue to make referrals if needed. Um, and that should start recurring with, or that should start occurring within the first few sessions. If they're not making progress or you're seeing something else, um, make those referrals and making, make sure that these patients are getting the care that they deserve. Um, multidisciplinary, again, really important to be, um, to be working with pulmonology um, and any other folks that need to be involved with the care of these patients. Um, sometimes some of these barriers can involve, you know, the laryngeal irritation that's still continuing or mental health that is a barrier. Um, Again, compliance with the breathing techniques. If they're not doing the breathing techniques, they're not going to help them. Um, sometimes secondary gain is something to be watching out for. They're just not getting better, but they can um, do the techniques solidly. Um, and then complexity of the sport I'll talk about in just a second. Um, for these patients, if this is purely VCD and not asthma and they have um, inhalers, it can be really a good idea to try to get these patients off of unnecessary inhaler use. But again, I'm not an MD. I want to work closely with pulmonology to um, come up with a plan. So like I said, I'll talk about considerations for different athletes. 
um, different sports require different demands. And so um, just the timing and the rhythm of the sport is important to consider. For example, swimmers, um, there's a, there, it's not uncommon to hear about swimmers having VCD and they can be really tricky because obviously they only have such a small amount of time that they can breathe when they're getting their head out of the water. Um, so trying to figure out the timing and the rhythm that they can implement this breathing technique is really, um, can be very difficult. And um, this article right here does a good job of outlining different things to consider. Um, with athletes, I like to um, be really specific about um, the different breathing techniques and when and how you can implement those. So thinking about like a preventative standpoint before um, just when they're first starting their workout and um, they're getting their breathing going, um, using the breathing techniques in like a preventative sense. And then when they get up to the point where they're um, having the most issues, uh, rescue rescue mentality, and then recovering, getting back into normal breathing patterns. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, this article here has a lot of great information. I wasn't planning on going into it today. I don't have time for that. Um, so those are different factors to consider. You can be more specific with these athletes. Um, also something to keep in mind is that if um, a lot of times these athletes have been sidelined by their VCD, and so once you treat the VCD and you feel like you have it good to go, um, it's not always most feasible to just have them return straight back to their sport because they're not in game day condition. Um, however, this can be a benefit for um, their treatment of VCD. So as they're, you know, they're starting to um, get more into their normal practices with their team or with their coaches, um, and they're probably starting to do even more just at home workouts or solo workouts. So having them um, have more opportunities to implement the breathing techniques is really important to help them figure out what they need to do and um, just all the different considerations for their sport. Um, and also collaborating with their coaches and athletic trainers can be um, really highly beneficial. Other considerations in terms of therapy, simply reassuring the patients that they're okay is a very powerful tool, um, reminding them that they have volitional control, again, showing them the laryngoscopy and showing them what they have the power to do, um, reassuring them that their O2 is staying within normal limits and this is not a life-threatening issue. Um, even if a person were to lose consciousness, their respiratory pattern is going to return to normal. Um, so keeping all these different things in mind, just simple reassurance can be um, really helpful. And again, like I talked about earlier, that long and frustrating clinical pathway to getting to your office um, is, is something to think about as well. Um, and just how they might react to, you know, the simplicity of the breathing exercise and having to go through that rule out process. Um, even if they are stepping into your office and they haven't been ruled out for um, other respiratory issues, it's important to have them do that just to make sure that you're not missing something. Um, additional therapeutic options for these patients if the um, if just the respiratory retraining isn't doing everything it needs to um, addressing diaphragmatic breathing again trying to reduce the upper body tension um, desensitization this is a lot of times with um, the smells and the other triggers um, and doing that systematically coughing and throat reduction or throat clear reduction strategies. Um, that can be as simple as an effortful cough instead of throat clearing. Again, with um, kind of that chronic cough, um, that neurological loop of sending the signals back and, and creating a habit out of it, we're trying to reduce that as much as possible. Vocal hygiene, good old vocal hygiene, never really hurt anybody, so um, important to address if you need to. Um, we can't prescribe um, reflux meds, but those behavioral reflux pre precautions we can always talk about. Um, you know, avoiding eating late at night, elevating the head of the bed, avoiding all those good foods, etc. And then inspiratory muscle retraining. Um, we sometimes use these little devices where you can change the resistance um, where they're breathing in and you can change the resistance of how much they need to um, inhale. So that can also be helpful. However, we know that the breathing techniques are the tried and true. Medical interventions that um, we might ask you guys for help with. 
Um, again, if the laryngeal irritation isn't going away and needs some extra help, sometimes those antihistamines, H2 blockers, um, PPIs, etc., whatever they need for that laryngeal irritation, um, referring them to psych for um, any kind of anti-anxiety, if that is a significant barrier to their progress. Um, Heliox, I just wanted to talk about this quickly. Um, Heliox is, um, from the data I've seen, it's been either like an 80-20 or a 70-30 um, ratio. Um, it can sometimes be helpful for acute management, but not always. It's always better to um, approach this from a chronic behavioral um, therapeutic standpoint. Um, so what it's doing is um, the helium has a lower density than nitrogen, which we commonly find in the air. And so that's reducing the turbulence and helping them um, feel like they're having or helping them breathe more easily, but it's not changing that paradoxical vocal fold movement. So um, acute management might be helpful, but might not. Um, and Botox injections, if it's really severe, um, Again, leaving that for the most severe cases. You just don't want to inject any just anybody with Botox um, in the larynx. Um, might be an option for these folks. All right, and lastly, the efficacy of the treatments that we're performing. Um, we have decent data out there, but again, we need to learn more. Um, so a systemic review back from 2015 demonstrated that 89% of the studies included had or demonstrated an improvement or complete resolution of symptoms with SLP treatments. We know that high frequency treatments is better than low frequency. However, low frequency um, treatments is still beneficial and still yields positive outcomes. Um, a more recent study from a couple of years ago, 90% of ER patients um, are ER visits due to inducible laryngeal obstruction may have been prevented by SLP behavioral treatment. Um, so trying to get them to us as fast as you can um, for treatment is really helpful. Um, 75 to 80 percent of patients improved or um, demonstrated improvement or complete resolution of symptoms with just the breathing exercises alone. That's a great number. Um, and that's really that purse slip breathing, the is really the important um, active ingredient for this therapy. And 85% of patients felt that having that visual biofeedback when they're symptomatic, asymptomatic, and doing the simulability was the most important part of their therapeutic process. So um, that's such a powerful tool, and it's really important to use that as a tool to benefit you and your patient. Alrighty, that's all I have for you guys. Um, Again, I was not able to see any of the chats, so let me, um, and there's references in here as well, um, if you're wanting to look up any of those articles in my email if you have any questions, but let me just stop my screen share and see if there are any questions in there. Um, not seeing any in the chat, not seeing any Q&As, so... There's about five minutes left. If anybody has questions, feel free to go for it. Otherwise, that is all I have for you guys. I hope that this was um, beneficial, not only um, if there are any speech pathologists out there who are learning or wanting to learn more about VCD and its treatment, but also for other professionals out there um, to get a sense of what we're doing as SLPs and um, why our therapeutic approach can be so, so successful for these patients. And again, the teamwork that we have going on. All right. You're so welcome, Sarah Lynn. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I left my email on there and the references. And Sarah Lynn, I'll email you my handout in just a second. Sorry, I delayed with that.